I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2014 uh, SU Research Day and Innovation Showcase. I'm Clifton Griffin, Dean of Grad Studies and Research. First and foremost, thank all of you for being here. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank our Provost, Dr. Allen, sitting back here for her support for this event and for research and scholarship overall. This day is about creating connections. Uh, those connections are important, whether it's faculty member to faculty member right here on campus, um, or it's creating connections between our campus and the outside community. That's what we hope will be the takeaway message from your presentations today. As you can tell from the program, we have a wide array of topics. It's going to be fascinating. Um, I can't wait. I've already had a little bit of a snippet of almost all of the presentations, and I can tell you, you will be wild. Uh, also awesome to see some of last year's presenters who are here supporting folks from this year. Uh, we're going to certainly appreciate their participation and their being here. And for our final talk of the evening, we're going to close you out with a bang. Hasn't this been an awesome afternoon? Our final presenter, faculty presenter of the afternoon, is John Wesley Wright. His presentation will be Laude. Now you think that's not a southern word. <laughs> Laude. I'm sure it's supposed to be pronounced differently. <laughs> One more time. It's so like an awful lot like Laude. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you say it. <laughs> Laude. Confronting the celebrant of Leonard Bernstein's nice. Steinstein. Yeah. It's five o'clock. This is my ninth one. All right. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, greetings. So here we are at the bottom of the ninth, and uh, I am uh, feeling a little bit of pressure from Clifton Griffin to hit a home run right now, um, but uh, we, we'll do the best we can. So for those of you who don't know me, I am John Wesley Wright. I am a professional tenor, uh, voice teacher, tennis fan, and a pretty mean Scrabble player. Uh, hearing several of the presentations today, uh, I want to say that it's truly an honor to be in such esteemed company and to share my research focus with you. As a concert artist, I tend to weave in personal commentary for, audi for audiences. I often share my story of taking part in the American Traditions Competition in 2000 and how I resisted doing that competition because of a prevalent mindset that valued classical music only, something still taught in many vocal programs throughout the country. I proceeded to do the co competition nevertheless and prepared three levels of repertoire, all required uh, repertoire. The songs I chose encompassed a breadth of American traditions, including American opera, American art song, blues, jazz, gospel, spirituals, and folk songs. Just think about all of that musical diversity. America has been busy. By the way, my audiences usually cheer when I get to the part of having won the competition. <laughs> Very good, very good. But the most poignant part of that story is that it took something as extraordinary as a medal around my neck to awaken in me the joy and importance of embracing many styles. That has become an indispensable part of my professional life. This same eclectic musical direction bore fruit a decade later in 2011 when I sang the leading role of the celebrant for the 40th anniversary performances of Leonard Bernstein's theater piece, Mass. The production was a collaboration between the Dayton Philharmonic Orchestra and Wright State University. Now, it might sound crazy, but it, it was actually during the curtain call of the final performance of Mass, 2,500 people on their feet, standing ovation, that I realized this masterwork by Bernstein with its schizophrenic ju juxtaposition of styles had profound implications. This moment ignited in me an intense curiosity 
about the celebrant's radically diverse music and its potential to forge connections between disparate groups of people. This curiosity was then channeled into my doctoral dissertation at the University of Cincinnati, Go Bearcats. <laughs> Bernstein composed a mass for the opening of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC, subtitled, a theater piece for singers, players, and dancers. The work premiered on September 8th, 1971. Its combination of Roman Catholic liturgy as backdrop, stirring theatrical interpolations and daring even blasphemous originality, some blasphemy uttered even by the officiating celebrant himself, made for a bizarre spectacle indeed, one that continues to shock and puzzle audiences while also moving them. Challenging and provocative, this unprecedented work does not lend itself to easy, simple analysis. What does one make of a work self-identified as a celebration of the Catholic rite, yet replete with sacrilegious turns of plot, profanities, and other excesses of theatrical artistic license. Perhaps only Bernstein himself was capable of producing such a genius conglomeration, bridging so many different worlds, audaciously synthesizing irreverent stage spectacle with Christian sacred ritual. But Mass's inclusiveness doesn't end there. It also references Judaism, religious doubt, and the abandonment of religion. Initially, it was the diversity and the eclecticism of Mass that was compelling to me, but that had already been pretty widely researched, so I had to dig deeper. And I found that there was very little focus specifically on the character that I played, the celebrant. What was unique about this guy and what was he about? My research thus focused on the celebrant's musical and dramatic journey and particularly studied musical borrowing. Musical borrowing, simply put, is a composer's use of existing musical material to compose new music. Essentially, I find functional and communicative significance in the choices Bernstein made concerning musical borrowing and in the variety of sources from which he borrowed. My findings examine how Bernstein chose and manipulated his sources in view of several objectives crucial to the work's composition and its function in opening the Kennedy Center. In addition, I consider these aims in light of the work's controversial reception and the types of values or meanings ascribed to it by the composer and audiences alike. The objectives include the widely discussed reaffirmation of faith, which Bernstein himself strove to express in mass, the defiance of political and religious dogma as existed at the time of the Nixon administration and the war in Vietnam, use of his own personalized faith symbolism, and above all, a creative synthesis of vernacular and classical influences, something for which he remains most celebrated. In all, I have taken the music of the celebrant as a linchpin for understanding Bernstein's eclect eclecticism as indeed something carefully and strategically managed. By considering the celebrant's music in light of Bernstein's appropriation of source material and his manipulation of the diverse styles represented, this character and his centrality to the work gains significant clarity. These styles range from traditional Judaic chant to evocations of such contemporary figures as Aaron Copland, to illusions uh, of uh, popular music from Broadway and film, 
and insights into how, how dis such distinct sources and styles figure into the music of the celebrant offer, offer, I argue, an extraordinary opportunity for viewing Bernstein's eclectic compositional approach at its best. In my thesis, I demonstrate that Bernstein's compositional choices concerning diverse uh, borrowed sources and their compositional manipulation do indeed closely and revealingly align with his professed aims in composing the work. In short, knowledge of these, borrowing, uh, of these borrowings illuminates how Bernstein worked in view of several specific goals surrounding mass. These goals include christening a new national performance hall, paying homage to the Kennedy family and its legacy of liberalism, uh, a reaffirming of, faith, uh, of a faith free of religious dogma. And finally, Bernstein aims in mass to restore the traditional, traditional values of tonality, accessibility, and cathartic emotional expression, values long besieged by the musical avant-garde at the time. To illustrate Bernstein's creative strategy, we must look at the celebrant's five principal solos. Number one, a simple song. Bernstein borrows his main motive from, of a simple song from his mentor, Aaron Copeland. Bernstein appropriates the motive clearly borrowing from Copeland's film music for Our Town, a piece of classic Americana from 1940. Bernstein's appropriation of Copeland's style grounds his own musical idealization of simplicity and faith and bolstered his own reactionary stance against the musical avant-garde. And before you go to the next uh, uh, slide, well, I'm just gonna sing that for you. Uh, that's okay. Lauda, uh, lauda, laude. Wanna join me? Do that. Lauda, lauda, laude. You're hired. <laughs> For the solo entitled The Word of the Lord, Bernstein draws upon a Pan American source, one known to him through a recording by the Chilean folk singer and protest artist Violeta Parra. His title for this particular solo parallels that of Parra's recording named Versos por la Sagrada Escritura, or Verses for Scripture. Bernstein's appropriation of Parra's style and his knowledge of her involvement in the Nueva Canción movement lends to mass an element of social protest implicitly registering his well-known dissatisfaction with the Nixon administration. To set the Lord's Prayer, Bernstein resorts to recycling of his own well-established procedures of using musical ciphers to symbolize God. In this brief setting, uh, Bernstein includes again and again several musical symbols of faith in a highly dense and abstract manner. As shown in the slide, all occurrences of these motives and their permutations use methods drawn from set theory, which is another talk <laughs> entirely. All technical details aside, these annotations simply suggest the great frequency in which these so-called faith motives embed themselves within the setting. Paradoxically, the music itself sounds anything but abstruse or abstract. Rather, it sounds like Bernstein's customary style, wonderfully, wonderfully lyrical, and accessible, and it goes something like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Something like that. <clears throat> Thank you. For the penultimate solo, entitled I Go On, Bernstein appears to quote from a classic popular song called I Remember You. Does anybody know I Remember You? I remember you. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And Bernstein sings, uh, when the thunder rumbles. So it's, you could argue that it's very close. Though this song was popular on the radio in the 40s, many people don't realize that it debuted in the film The Fleet's Inn, a remarkably trashy propaganda film <laughs> from 1942 and amid World War II. In I Go On, Bernstein's use of material within Origins and Hollywood serves to keep the celebrant real. He keeps the character close to the vernacular world of a, re a real guy in blue jeans beneath all the priestly vestments. And for the climax of Mass and the celebrant's final solo, fraction, things get broken. Bernstein takes his point of departure from the opposite end of the cultural spectrum. Instead of the kitsch world of low Hollywood, he draws from the exalted heights of grand opera. In this pivotal moment, the sacred altar gets broken and the celebrant himself becomes broken down. Bernstein carries the celebrant through a 20-minute whirlwind of musical styles and texts by representing a fraction of all that had gone before in Mass, this final solo achieves a fusion, pulling everything together via a well-known operatic convention, the Mad Scene. <laughs> Bernstein's precise model for fraction derives from a particular Mad Scene in one of the most widely performed 20th century operas, Benjamin Britten's Peter Grimes composed in 1944. Bernstein had conducted the US premiere of this opera and it reportedly remained one of his all-time favorite works. The mad scene of Peter Grimes leaves potent traces on the celebrant who, like Peter Grimes, dissolves into mute silence after a string of excruciatingly emotional outbursts and linguistic non sequiturs. By borrowing from the cultivated tradition of serious opera, as well as the kitsch world of Hollywood and seemingly everything in between, the celebrant takes the proverbial cake like no other role. In summary, through focusing on the celebrant of mass and the musical borrowings used to create this character, I highlight the unusually rich array of influences and resources in the work. As scholar, I see the role as affording entry into the crux of Bernstein's eclecticism, perhaps matchless in scope. 
such knowledge about the construction of the celebrant affords insight into how and why mass arose at the tense crossroads of national public ritual and illuminates the viability of a tradition-based tonal language and the importance of faith. In brief, the celebrant's music emerges as the key to unlocking a theatrical work in some ways quasi-religious, but at the same time over the top, even profane, though with proven potential for genuinely moving audiences and participants alike. Long after mass premiered, many still condemn it, condemn it as hopelessly conflated, vulgar, empty of substance, showy, and so on. Such dismissals often cite the work's hodgepodge of eclectic influences and juxtapositions of popular and classical music as principal culprits. Having survived into its fifth decade, perhaps Mass has managed to outlast at least some of the original critics, for it has, for it has survived long enough to witness a veritable sea change within the classical music scene. Stylistic diversity has now become the norm in musical performance. Today's opera companies, orchestras, and concert artists are actively integrating popular vernacular works into their programming. In light of this relatively new acceptance of crossover repertoire, Bernstein's mass seems nothing less than prophetic. Portraying the role of the celebrant certainly proved for me a life-defining moment. It reawakened uh, the feeling that art music included much more than I had been taught. My research into this fascinating theatrical work further, further clarified my own eclectic awareness and mission. From my perspective, mass fits into the larger world of the arts and humanities by celebrating the diversity of human language, philosophy, style, ritual, and belief, demonstrating their persistence through Earth's troubled times. Mass attempts to bridge the gap separating us from ourselves, from each other, and yes, from the divine. That vision of connection is what underlies its gospel of simplicity and inclusiveness. Thank you. And I don't think that it would be right not to end the presentation with the most beloved piece from Mass, A Simple Song. Sing God a simple song Loud, loud Make it up as you go along Loud, loud Sing like you like to sing. God loves all simple things. For God is the simplest of all. For God. Simplest of all. I will sing the Lord a new song to praise him, to bless him, to bless the Lord. 
I will sing his praises while I live all of my days. Blessed is the man who loves the Lord. Blessed is the man who praises him. Lauda, 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 and walks in his ways. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. I will lift up my voice to the Lord, singing loud, loud it. For the Lord is my shade, is the shade upon my right hand, and the sun shall not smite me by day. Nor the moon by night. Blessed is the man who loves the Lord. Lord, 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 and walks in his way. I went over wow. time. I went over time so you wouldn't have to ask me questions. <laughs> if there is a question, please feel free. Where did you get that voice? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! What? You, somebody said Walmart. No. Um, <laughs> gosh, I, I I had a mentor in uh, a wonderful mentor in in undergrad school who used to you know, emphasize how we were just wonderful uh, amalgam, amalgamations of, of, our, of the different genes of pools of our parents and, and pointed out, you know, you definitely got this from your mother and you definitely got this from your father and, and then it just sort of mixes. So I think that might be where, and, and, a, little bit, and a little bit of divine stuff in there too. <laughs> A little bit of that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, Don. my pleasure.